It's the Billy Graham Boxing Podcast, The Preacher's Sermons. Billy Graham doing a podcast, who'd have thought it? Yeah, well, you know, the Boxing Month is, um, that's not, I used to enjoy doing the column in the Boxing Monthly and that, that's um, stopped now. I think Boxing News has bought it, have they? Something like yeah, I think they're all owned by the same people these oh, days. Yeah. So, yeah, so I thought maybe it's about time to do a podcast because yeah. I like talking about boxing. I suppose we should have start by officially welcoming people to the, the first ever Billy Graham Boxing Podcast. Uh, I'm John Evans and the unmistakable dulcet Salford tones you just heard of a, the one and only Billy Graham. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to expect. Um, Dr. Doolittle telling Burt Sugar stories with Gordon, Lang's, Lang, uh, Gordon Ramsay's language. I think that's pretty much going to be what it's going to turn out like, Billy. But um, for one thing fans can be assured of is you're going to tell the truth. Yeah, that's, that's, they, can, they, they definitely can be assured of that, you know what I mean? Um, I, 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 you know, that's, it's for the fans, you know what I mean? And um, for boxing fans, and um, they can ask me any question that they want and I will answer them absolutely truthfully, yeah. you know what I mean? So I welcome that. Any, anybody who wants to ask any questions to me, they can be. Yeah, that's what we want it to become. Lots of people do boxing podcasts these days. Um, we want it to be a bit different. We, we Really, we want the fans to guide us, don't we? Sending your questions will be a, a Twitter page up. There'll be an email address where you can send in anything. We'll, and that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to let the fans guide us. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I want to talk about um, what they want to talk about or anything they ask me because it's the fans who make, it, who make us. Do you know what I mean? Uh, without the fans, they're the most important people. Um, so without the fans, we're, we're nothing. No yeah. sportsman's anything without the fans. So that's what that's what I'm the most interested in. So I welcome any questions, however, whatever they want to ask me, and I'll tell them. There's the nothing truth. off limits, Billy. Nothing's off limits at all. You want to be careful. You don't really, really know the internet very well, do you? No, I don't go on social media <laughs> at, at all, and I never will, to be honest with you. So if anybody insults me, I won't even hear it. <laughs> now, ordinarily, these fights happening this side of the Atlantic, that side of the Atlantic, all over the world, there's plenty to talk about, but the weird situation we're in at the minute, it's pretty scarce news, but the one thing that has got the fans talking about is little promising signs that Joshua, Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury have had, you know how long the nego negotiations take for a big fight, yeah, believe me, years, but there's positive signs. Yeah, there's positive signs, but I mean, it, it, it comes to point, look, the fact of the matter is, fighters, they've got the hardest job in the world, it's a, it's a really hard, it's a brutal life, it's a really hard life. So, you know, you've got to get as much money as possible in the bank because it's a short life as well. But the thing about the Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury fight is um, they've both got more money they can spend. The people who promote them guys have got more money they can, than they can spend. Um, so I think it's about time to never, don't, give a shit about the governing bodies and all that. I'm not interested in the governing bodies whatsoever. It's about time that um, they, 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 they two just got together. I know that they're supposed to have, they've got, um, Fury's got Wilder waiting in the wings and, and, and um, Joshua's got Pulev and all that, but it's just time to get it on. Um, people want to know who the best ever weight in the world is. People w really want to know who the best ever in the world is. For me, Tyson Fury, I'm a fan of both guys. I'm a, fan of, I'm a big fan of Tyson's. I know, I know the family. I've known the family for years. Um, obviously, it's from Manchester anyway, you know what I mean? Tyson Fury never lost his title in the ring, so Tyson Fury is still, and he is the lineal champion of the world. Do you know what I mean? I'm a big fan of Anthony Joshua's as well. He's got a huge following. He's a, he's a great fighter as well. Um, they're rich enough. Everybody involved in that fight is rich enough to fuck the governing bodies off and just get together and fight. Well, this is, it's, it's certainly once in my lifetime, I think it's once ever, Britain's got the top two heavyweights in the world. Uh, that's never happened in my lifetime and I'm ancient. And um, the, the wind, you know what boxing's like, God, the best laid plans can go to shit like that, can't they? So I, I'm, I'm with you, I think it's got to happen now. And I personally think, I know there's lots of rumours about where the fight's going to happen, it seems like it's probably going to end up in the Middle East somewhere. I think it'd be an absolute travesty for British boxing fans if that fight between the best two big men in the world didn't take place in Britain. Well, I think I agree with you entirely. I'd be disgusting if it takes place in Saudi Arabia. Now, I know money talks, 
But everybody, but everybody involved in this in this promotion have all got more money than, than they can spend, right? So there's no excuse for putting even more money to go and fight in a country where the British fans will be reluctant to go to, and a country where, let's face it, it's a brutal country. It's got some. It's got ridiculous rules. It's got the, um, you know, it's a. All I can say is it's a brutal country. Yeah. You know what I mean? But my, my way of thinking, you know, new people are coming to the sport. If, say, the Sultan of Brunei suddenly started saying he was interested in cricket, it's like us giving him the ashes. We're giving these people who are new to the sport the crown jewels. This is the biggest fight in British boxing history. Absolutely. Joshua, Tyson Fury, Wembley Stadium, 80,000 people. As you say, imagine the pay-per-view figures, imagine the receipts. There's enough money there for that fight to happen yeah, in Britain. They, yeah, everybody involved in this promotion is going to make fortunes. They're the two best heavyweights in the world, and I like both guys. Yeah. Trust me, I love both guys. I love Joshua, I love, I love Tyson Fury. Um, but look, the fans have made them. The fans have made them people wealthy people. I mean, more than wealthy people. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, you think it's time to give a bit back? Yeah, it is time to give a bit back. It is time to give a bit back to the fans. Uh, the fans deserve it. I mean, we have got the best. Well. Me and Ricky Atten, we had the best fans in the world. Everybody says that, but we did have the best fans in the world. Now, British boxing fans are the best in the world. Oh, the, oh forget about the Mexicans. Sorry for about the Mexicans, because they're great fight fans. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but other than the Mexicans, we are the best fight fans in the world. That's why all the top names, all, all the top fighters now want to fight, fight in England. So it would be a travesty, more than a travesty, it would be disgusting if them two don't fight in Britain. There's something else I want to ask you, oh, two, actually two things, put your trainer's head on for a minute because I, I know it never leaves you. Both fighters had little, well Tyson had big changes to his training camp before the last fight and we saw a totally different fighter. Absolutely. Something actually you, you alluded to in Boxing Monthly didn't you, you said he, if Tyson sits down on his punches is aggressive, I'm sure you said he would stop Wilder. Yeah I did say he'd stop Wilder. Uh, and Joshua had more subtle he introduced new people into his training camps. Who, who were you most impressed with and who do you think benefited from the changes I actu most? I actually, um, I, look, Anthony Joshua did what he thought he had to do. Um, and he actually proved me wrong because I thought if he boxed and moved, I thought that he would get beat. I didn't, I didn't want Joshua to take that approach. I wanted Joshua to do a demolition job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The same as George Foreman did to Joe Frazier. So, I, will, I, I, I hope. I, how much did Andy Ruiz contribute to Joshua being able to do what he that, did well, that that's night? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Anthony Joshua, I don't think they was the right tactics. I know he won the title back and he beat and, and, he, beat, and, he, beat, and he beat Andy Ruiz, but Andy Ruiz let everybody down. He let himself down. He let his trainers down. He let his father down. He let, he let the fans down. Andy Ruiz is coming even fatter than he usually does. And um, I think the reason, one of the reasons why Joshua won was because Andy Ruiz was so bad. Yeah. I, don't, I, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have fought Andy Ruiz that way if I had, the, if I had Anthony Joshua. Do you think Joshua... I Anthony Joshua to, to take it to him and, and to, do a, to do a George Foreman, Joe Frazier well, job. And that's what he's... That's what, that's you, what you'll I know way better than me, but surely going at... He, he, I can't see for the life of me Anthony Joshua outboxing Tyson Fury. He's going to have to be more aggressive. Do you think... The Joshua tactics and performance against Ruiz was a temporary thing to be safe, get the titles back, or do you think that might be the way Joshua fights from no, now on? No, I'm hoping it was a temporary thing. Just Joshua is a big, powerful man. And I think his boxing skills are underrated. He's got great leverages, he's got a good variety of punches, as you've seen against when he fought Klitschko and that. Um, Anthony Joshua is a much better fighter than the way he fought against Andy Ruiz. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just hope it, I, I hope that, that I, I hope that that isn't how he's going to fight anymore. Yeah. I want him to go back to the old Anthony Joshua, who puts it on people and knocks them out. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, that's what I want to see. So the answer to your question, I was much more impressed by Tyson's Fury tactics. Now I thought that's what Tyson Fury needed. Yeah. Look, I've watched Tyson. I've watched Tyson all, the, all his career. Do you know what I mean? Nobody's had to teach Tyson how Fury out of box. Tyson Fury is a natural, do you know what I mean? He's rhythmic, he's tall, he's smooth, he's got a great jab, he fights fantastic from the distance and that, you know what I mean? Um, 
Nobody has to teach him to do that. Yeah. But he needs to sit down on his shots more. Do you know what I mean? Because he's not getting the best out of himself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. By just boxing that way, you know. And look, Ben, do you think, do you ben think... Davidson did a good job yeah. about getting Tyson out of a dark place. And that's more important than boxing, to be honest with you. Yeah. So hats off to him for that. But I just don't think he was anywhere near experienced enough to work with a fighter like Tyson. He can't teach Tyson anything. Tyson did what he always does when he fought Wilder the first time. And he was robbed, by the way, yeah. when he fought Wilder the first time. When I knew, when I, when I knew he was going to the Kronk, I, I, don't know, I don't know Sugar Hill, do you know what I mean? Um, but I know the Kronk. Yeah. And I know, and I know Manny, I know Manny, you know what I mean? I know Manny's methods, you know what I mean? And I heard Sugar Hill was like the same, the same ilk, do you know what I mean? But plus... Um, Andy Lee. Andy Lee. Andy Lee was there. And Andy Lee's like um, a perfect Kronk fighter, tall, um, massive punchy bow, but he does it with leverages and timing, not, not brute strength. Yeah. Now, when I, when, I, when I knew that Andy Lee was being involved and he was going to the Kronk, I was over the moon because I knew they was going to teach him to sit down on punches. And, um, and plus, let me tell you something as well, they've, they've not scratched the surface yet. No, well, that, I if was going to say... If he keeps working on that stuff and getting that right hand better, yeah. and, and there's room for improvement there, you know what I mean, and, be, and, and you know, put it on people and stuff like that, he'll get better. Tyson will get be even better. I was going to say, if... if I was asking you whether Joshua, you thought it was a temporary change in tactics to just get through that fight, but Fury going to the Kronk, that seems to me like a more permanent change, you know, that's a style they're fighting, and there's not going to be different tailoring styles to suit different fighters as much at the Kronk, is there? That'll be a permanent change to Tyson's yeah, style. I, I, hope, I hope it's a permanent change to Tyson's style, because that's, that's all he needs to add to his arsenal, yeah. do you know what I mean? He can do all the other stuff, he can do the other stuff in his sleep, do you know what I mean? He's bound to do that. He just needs to add more to his arsenal and it's sitting down on shots and getting a bit more power. Now, just keep that trainer's mindset. I'm not going to ask you who's going to win the fight. We've got a year to talk about it. It's going to drag on forever. Given each fighter's skill set and what you've seen, whose camp would you prefer to be in? Who would you, pre who would you prefer to be taken into that fight, Billy? Which raw materials would you like to mould? They've both got great raw materials. You've got to pick one. I'm going to put I'm you on the pick, spot. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to pick one and it's going to be Tyson Fury. Um, that's not to say anything detrimental about Anthony Joshua. I really like the guy. I think he's great for boxing. Um, I've never met him personally, do you know what I mean? But I really like the guy. And look, he's got the firepower to knock anybody out. And he's, he's, I think his boxing ability is a bit underrated, to be honest with you. Yeah. After that mess up with um, Andy Ruiz, which I know my, I'm the only one who keeps on saying it, but there was something wrong with him that night. He wasn't right that night. He shouldn't have been in the ring that night. So I'm a big fan of Anthony Joshua's as well. But um, I'd have to go. With, I'd have to go with. Um, I'd have to go with Tyson Fury. Um, and if I if I, if I had to bet, I'd actually bet. I'd bet on Tyson Fury. But right. Joshua's got the firepower to take him out. Um, but no. And hey, me and Tyson Fury both come from Manchester. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a little bit as well. That's a little. Right, for those of you who are listening to this, just to let you know, there is a video version of this podcast. Um, it's available on the VIP Promotions YouTube channel. It might just be worth checking it out. We're sat in a Billy's, outside Billy's bungalow. We've got a meadow stretching off. Which river is this, Billy? Over to our left. The River Tame. The River Tame, stretching out to the left. Uh, and on the table in front of us, we've got Billy's new pet. Go on, Billy, in introduce us. This is Tiger, the uh, pet Kestrel. She's only um, seven weeks old. Um, He's an old mate of mine who a lot of you will remember. A fighter called Gary Thornhill, Scouser, little pressure fighter. Um, he was the British champion. He's a falconer. And um, he's like, um, Gary's my trainer. He's teaching me how to man the bird, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> right, so it's, it's a beautiful. He yeah, he, come, he comes down here. He'll be coming down here in the next few days. And he, he was there last week and that, teaching me how to do it. So. And, and tell, tell the people listening where, where this uh, Kestrel's living. Where it's living? Well, it's basically living in my house. It's, it's, what, you, it's, what, you call, it's what you call an imprint. Apparently, it thinks I'm its mother. So you're not going to start breastfeeding it, are Which you? Which is nice. No, if I could, I would. <laughs> and the, but this thing comes everywhere with you, doesn't it? You know, I, I, I believe it sits perched on your head when you go for a shit. That, 
I don't think I'm going to go for a shit, but when I go for a piss, it sits on my, sh it sits on my shoulder and that. And she does like jumping on my head sometimes and all that. Like, she sits watching the telly with me and that on my shoulder and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, it's, the, it's the first bird of prey you've had, isn't it? But animals, Billy, you, you're in out, you, your tattoos on your hand, you know, on your arms and stuff, is snake, reptiles, that. frogs, and you're renowned for it, aren't you? You used to have, what animals did you used to have in the gyms in the past? Oh, I, I, got, I, got them, I got them by mistake. I actually, was got, I actually went down to, I was going to buy a bird of prey. Yeah. Um, and I went down to this guy who had an aviary, he had um, owls and hawks and that. Uh, I know a few people who were falconers, you know what I mean? And um, I was going to get a bird of prey and the, the people, they had a couple of iguanas. And um, they like adult iguanas or well-grown iguanas, you know what I mean? And uh, the guys were scared of them, so... I, I took the iguanas and I, I just had them in the display cabinet in my gym. I ended up giving them to a zoo. Yeah. But Give, giving them to a zoo. But you didn't just go and get an iguana one day. When you were a kid, were you lifting up rocks and picking up the centipedes? And my, you, what, were, you, were you always rooting around from, in...? From, from being a little kid, my hobby was like turning old stones to see what was underneath them and that, you know. And um, that's, that, I'd love doing how, that. How exotic did I things get in Salford? Listen. I was born in I was born in the fifties. People, herpetology, you know, people who keep reptiles and amphibians, is quite common now. But it's massive now. You know what I mean? Everybody has them. But in them days, nobody had anything like that. But um, I, I got my first lizard when I was seven, um, and I've kept them ever since. Lizards, snakes, frogs, toads. Um, I've had a monkey um, and a marmoset. Um, there, there is, there is going to be a, a special edition of this podcast where I get Billy to describe the, the tower block flat in Salford where we had two monkeys and what type of lizard was it? It was a, it was a huge iguana. It was a fully, a huge, grown, it was a fully grown iguana. Roaming wild in the, on the top floor yeah, flat of a what, Salford used, housing used estate. To live, used to live wild in the, in the house and then um, I ended up, ended up having this monkey. That's, a, that's for another tale. You know what I mean? That's another, that's another, that's another story mm. itself. But I did end up with a, with, with a monkey as well. I mean, it wasn't my decision about this. I just ended up with this monkey. So I ended up like the, the three, and I built a massive cage for it in my bedroom, but I never put it in it. So the monkey and the iguana just used to live in the house with me. But that's for that's <laughs> that's, that's, another, that's, that's, a, that's an time. episode on its own. That. To talk about fucking boxing. <laughs> no, people need. It's funny, Billy. Billy's got so many stories, and some of them will have you doubled over laughing. So the idea of this is, we can all talk about boxing. Boxing can talk about Billy can talk about boxing like nobody else. But there's so many other stories and stuff that I, I, I think I've got away, people have got away. Like when you were she'd be flying free in quite a few, in well, I don't know how long really. I have to wait for till Gary tells me. Till Gary tells you. But, but you know when you said you weren't getting these iguanas, tell tell the listeners about um when you were a young 10 year old and you found your way down to Tib Street and the reptile shop? I mean, you know, I mean Tib Street was um, the first place where there was any ex exotic animals, you know what I mean? Like I said, I got my first lizard when I was seven. Then days, kids used to walk around all over, used to walk to town, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you very rarely had the bus fare. But this, this particular day, when, and um, you're talking about when I nicked the snake, aren't you? <laughs> I hope you're going to talk about nicking the snakes. Right. <laughs> So I just I just cycled up one day to Tib Street and um, they just got a batch of um, grass snakes. Um, they, they had they had quite a, they had quite a lot of stuff, you know what I mean. And the place used to be absolutely teeming, really full, you know what I mean. And um, so these 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 grass snakes was at the bottom, right at the bottom of, of the shop, the bottom layer of tanks at the shop. So I'm kneeling down looking at these snakes. I'm noticing that all I can see is people's legs right next to me. Do you know what I mean? I've never had a pot of pissing, you know what I mean? Never anymore. And um, I thought, I could nick one of these now, you know what I mean? So anyway, I went across the street. I, I, I went outside and I picked up this little toffee bag, the little triangle-shaped toffee bags, you know what I mean? And I got right near the tank and all these, because it was full of people, full of people. So nobody couldn't see me, you know what I mean? So I had to open the tank. I had to put the snake in my mouth <laughs> and then somehow manoeuvre it into the toffee bag <laughs> and it got me back and fucked off. <laughs> and that was, a, that was the start of it, the collection grew from there? The, I've had all kinds of collections, I've had all kinds of collections. I, I, it's, 
it's like all my life and that. I mean, our kid was in the army, he bought me a boa constrictor when I was about, I don't know, about 11. <laughs> no, I used to walk around with this boa constrictor. Nobody's seen anything like that in them days, you know what I mean? It wasn't like that in them days, nobody had them. I had giant toads from South America and all that yeah. stuff, you know. And looking around here now, we've got tiger ver kestrel, we've got truffles, the terrier. Oh, the little grass snake what I got off Josh Warrington's dad. We've got a grass snake uh, just that Josh Warrington's dad gave you. Yeah, Sean. Sean gave me that. Um, Sean and Josh are my, my good mates of mine. Um, yeah, I'm going to let the grass snake go, though. Yeah. He, he, just, he, he knew a guy who's just, uh, who, who bred some grass snakes, and uh, he asked me, did I want to have one? I'd not had a grass snake since I was a kid, you know, since about, I don't know, for, not for years, and not had a grass snake, so I just thought it'd be interesting to read it. And um, I'm actually going to let it go where grass snakes live. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And just over our shoulder here, we've got the pond, which last year was full of yeah, I've got um, full of toads, and so we've got the preacher's polecat, which live in a house that's bigger than yours. Yeah, they me ferrets and that. Yeah, <laughs> young t one's called Young Tom, the other one's called um, I can't remember what. Oh, I've got a bullfrog. You've got a bullfrog? Yeah, I've got a South African bullfrog. When did you that? get the South I've, I've been coming here for four or five years and I didn't know you had a, a bullfrog. No, what, I, I've had that for um, over ten years. <laughs> More. Where does that live? He lives in a spare bedroom. Pepsi. Thomas, young Tom and Pepsi. That's have, pathetic. Have you got, a name, have you got a, a name for the snake? Could you give it a boxing... Could you give a snake no, a boxing I've, theme name, Billy? I've not, I've not, actually, I've not actually... They've not actually named the snake. Oh, of course! You know what? I'm forgetting everything. I always forget everything. Else. It's called Handsome Bob. Go on. Guy, out, uh, after the guy for, out of the rock and roller. Yeah, Handsome Bob it's called, the snake. Handsome Bob? Handsome Bob. Right, well, there we are. Is it feeding time for Tiger? Well, let's see. Come on, darling. Hey, you go. Good job we got sound effects, Mike. Uh, feeding time for Tiger. Uh, That's a mouse it's eating. It's eating a, it, it's eating a mouse. Something you don't, don't you know, get in any I, other podcast, Billy. You know what? I forget everybody's name. I, don't know what, I forget everybody's name all the time. And there That's we are. Go. Coming up in part three. In the future, part three uh, is going to be your questions, anything you want Billy to talk about. First episode, we've not got any questions, so we're going to go over a, a famous fight from Billy's past. Might not be the one you're thinking of. Now, Billy, normally in this third part, we're going to get listeners and viewers' questions in and stuff, but because we've got no questions, we're going to look back at a famous fight from your career. A lot of people will be expecting us to talk about Ricky and Zoo, but I can't be bothered seeing you cry again. <laughs> you, you cry every day. I've seen you doing that on TV. Yeah, it does. Uh, I can't help it. Every time it makes me cry. So we're going to go back 17 years, it is, since Michael Gomez beat Alex Arthur. Is 17 that years. Ago it was? 17 years ago? Yeah. Wow. Crazy, isn't it? Now, yeah. a lot of people associate you and Mike, you know, because because of a couple of famous wins. But he came to you just a couple of fights prior to Arthur, didn't he? Yeah. Um, look, there was like this so-called rivalry, which didn't exist, about me and Brian Hughes about our gyms. The, the, the rivalry didn't exist at all. All the fighters was mates with Brian Hughes' fighters. I've known Brian Hughes since I was 16. Yeah. The first time was a fight was against one of Brian's guys. Um, in the NABCs, I fought one of Brian's guys. I used to spar with all his fighters when I was a fighter. All the colliers, he had a lot of good fighters, do you know what I mean? A lot of good. He's, Brian's always had good fighters, do you know what I mean? So the, there really was no rivalry between us in reality, yeah. but something was made of that. I don't know how it happened, but. You and, know. and at the time, we had Ricky lead him away. Arnie Farnell, a massive ticket seller, That's right. and Mike Gomez, all three came up together, didn't they? To be honest with you, to be honest with you the, the three of them are really instrumental. Um, although we had a lot of good fights in Manchester, I had, yeah. a, great, I had a great camp with Carl Thompson, Enzi and all that lot, and Steve Foster. Oh, they had a great Never camp. grabbed the attention for whatever reason, did they? Never well, sold Steve tickets. Foster was, Steve, Steve Foster Steve Foster was a huge ticket seller. Um, but I, I've got to say, what, what, what I think was really instrumental in bringing boxing back to life in Manchester was them three. It was Arnie Farnell, Michael Gomez and Ricky Hatton. Yeah. And Gomez, was Gomez... I, I, I love him, no offence, but I think Mike's probably my 
favourite Manchester fighter ever, when he wasn't with you and he was knocking around other gyms and doing whatever he did, did was he a fight you admired? Oh, of course, yeah. Mike, Mike's, Mike, look, Mike was made for me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I was always a big Mike Gomez fan, right from the first, first time I seen him, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, he was great to watch. Um, he's my kind of person, to be honest with you, you know what I mean? <laughs> I can understand that. You know, we used, to, we, we, we used to call ourselves rough as fuck promotions, do you know what I mean? So Michael Gomez fitted in, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, he really fitted in. Unbelievable character, isn't he? But, yeah. So he, Mike had had a, a good career, he'd won a Lonsdale belt, but he got, he he was going off, you know, he's living a, a wild life, should we say, Mike, wasn't he? And he got beat off Kevin Leary, he was a good fighter, but it looked like the end for Mike, didn't it? it, it look, we, look, don't forget, we're all close to that. We, all, all, all my guys all knew all that, them not on everything, you know what I mean? And we knew that Mike was going off the rails, it's no secret, do you know what I mean? We, he was going off the rails well before the Kevin Leary fight, do you know what I mean? Kevin Lee was a good fighter, yeah. without a doubt a good fighter, but I don't think he'd have beat the real Mike Gomez. But we could see it coming, we yeah. could see it and coming. And he was, he, was, he was cast adrift, wasn't he? Well, when Kevin Lee beat him, I think everybody had had enough of him, you know? I think Frank had had enough of him, I think Brian had had enough of him. Um, and I can, I can understand that, I, can, I really can understand that, but I didn't like the way that he was like... Um, just threw away like, you know what I mean? And, and people give up on him because he'd done so much for British boxing, uh, Manchester boxing. And um, so when he asked me to train him, I got everybody advised me against it. Um, I think Frank advised me against it, but, but that's off to Frank. He got, he, got him, he got him a few build-up fights. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't just thrown straight into Alex Arf, was he? I think he had I three fights. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have allowed that, to be honest with you. But give Frank his due, do you know what I mean? Because normally, as what happens in boxing, you get served up to the next up and coming star. Yeah. And that's the way it goes, that's the way boxing works. It's cruel, but that's the way boxing works. Yeah. And um, so when Mike come to me and asked me for the training, I'd said to him, listen, because he mentioned Alex Arthur, you know? And Alex Arthur was looking fantastic. I'm a, I was a big Alex, Alex Arthur fan, yeah. you know what I mean? Because he, he was a great prospect. And um, one of the things I said to him was, listen, don't start fucking talking about to Alex Arthur. Because I'm not putting you in with Alex Arthur. And she's shown me you've got something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I need to know what you've got. And um, like I say, so I, I said to Frank, you know what I mean? I want a, I need, I want a couple of build-up fights, you know what I mean? And uh, Michael come to my house. I own a, I own a, um, my missus, she, 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 she brought him down to my house, but we, we had a good long talk. Yeah. I oh, talked to the lads first, because I always, if, if I'm going to bring another fighter in, because I, had, I always had too many fighters, do you know what I mean? So I asked them all, I'm going to meet, I'm having a meeting with Michael Gomez today, and if he makes the right noises, he, want, and he wants to come here, you know what I mean? How yeah. do you all feel about it? And they all said, no, it's fine. Yeah. Some, yeah. Something you say to me, it's a, a quote that sticks in my head, as you say, uh, your fighters have got to be honest with you. Yeah. Because you're going to ask them to do some, you've got to ask them to do some unnatural things. Would, Absolutely. Was Mike honest with you in those three fights building up to Arthur and then in the build up to the Arthur fight? Did, was he aware of he, he was, was on his last chance? Was he as good he as knew, gold or? Uh, no, he knew it was his last chance. I told him I'd give him everything as long as he gives me everything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They had to live the life. Um, proper. He had to show me something. You know what I mean? And um, he did. He did. Right from right from right from day one. When he walked out of my house, um, he did everything. I, I tell him as well. Anything I ask you to do, I can explain why I'm asking you to do it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And he was um, fantastic to train. Um, he was a great member of the camp. He was loads of fun to be around. Mad as a fucking match. Yeah, yeah. Go on, what sort of stuff I mean? did Gomez get up to? Uh, oh, <laughs> Tell us about the, um, his moped when he, he thought the police were tailing him because he had drugs. I think he got arrested on, on this, on this moped. I think he'd been banned from driving or something. I don't know. So he, he started coming on a moped or something. I can't actually remember the details now. But anyway, he, his wife used to bring him down anyway in the end. Do you know what I mean? And um, she used to always bring him to the gym. She was a lovely girl. She was great. And um, 
No, everything went fantastic. And like I say, Frank did us a favour. He didn't just chuck him to the wolves right away, you know what I mean? And I said, I remember saying to Michael Gomez, I'll tell you when we're ready for, yeah. for um, Alex Arthur. Do you know what I mean? So Frank got us a couple of warm-up fights and that, you know what I mean? Mike was beaving himself and um, Mike was loving it in the gym. And like I say, he's my kind of fighter. Do you know what I mean? Well, the, the first time you, you took Ricky on the pads and, and the old body belt, and you, you said straight away you knew. The first time you took Gomez on with his head movement coming forward, that left hook, did, did you realise, you know, Jesus Christ, we can do something together here? Well, the thing, the thing about Michael Gomez is um, it's how close it could be. He, he didn't have as much flair as Ricky, obviously. Ricky's an all-time great. He didn't have as much flair as Ricky. He liked to move around, but he was good at it, you know what I mean? But what he was the master at is how sh close he could be and get that uppercut inside you. Yeah. He'd be right on you. I've seen the fucker hit his, hit his self <laughs> is that close, do you know what I mean? Yeah. He was the master at that, do you know what I mean? Um, and that's where... That's that's when I, that's how I knew he'd be Alex Arthur. It didn't turn out that way actually, but um, I knew that I knew that he had the tools to beat Alex Arthur. You know I me? Mean? Yeah. But I knew how, I knew how good Alex Arthur was. Trust yeah, me. Well, at the time, I won't be an after time here. He, it was the right fight for Alex, wasn't it? You know, Gomez was a known name. They were building Alex up. Um, he was going to be aggressive, he would probably come, go down swinging, as they say, wouldn't he? He'd make on, Alex look good. It was the right fight for Alex to take. On paper... I, I thought Alex would beat him. Everybody thought Alex would beat him. On paper, it was the right fight for Alex to take. Mike was in um, the last chance saloon, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it, it, was, it, was the, it was the perfect fight for Alex Arthur as well. But, look, anyway, as we go and we're going through training, and then he's getting better and better and better, and he's really living the life and he's doing great. I went, now we're ready for Alex Arthur. Yeah. Now we'll have it. Do you know what I mean? And um, so obviously I knew we was going to get offered it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And um, so anyway, they did. And uh, I remember telling I remember telling Frank and all his staff and that at the meetings, you know, the press conferences, and the, you know, all the stuff and that. You know, he's going to beat him. Do you know what I mean? But he's the wrong... He's not ready for Michael Gomez, right? He's not ready for Michael Gomez. Because Alex Arthur was very good. Um, great boxer, great technical boxer. But he had a wicked left hook to the body as well. Yeah. Nice left hook to the head. You couldn't fault him, to be honest with you. And he, he just looked up with Freddie Roach, hadn't he? Now, Freddie wasn't in the corner that night, but there was lots I wish of stories. You would have been. I'd have liked that. You'd have loved that, wouldn't you? I'd have absolutely loved that. I like going against famous trainers. It makes him all glory. <laughs> yeah, Billy doesn't just... When he goes against the famous trainer, it's not just fight against fight. You like to pick your wits against a, yeah. another top-level trainer, oh, don't you? Oh, God, yeah, that makes it like that. And it's great being the underdog as well. It's, it takes a lot of pressure being the underdog. I, I, I watched his fight the other day, and your face when you were stood behind Mike, when you had the Mexican hat on, oh, yeah. the atmosphere was... They hated you, didn't they? But it looked like you were absolutely loving it, you, you Mike, and the team that night. We was right, we was right up for it, and I had Ricky in the corner um, as well, because Ricky was the up-and-coming star, you know what I mean? And... Um, I thought that might put a little bit of fear into him. You know what I mean? Paul Smith and Stevie Bell all on the, the all, front row. All the guys was all there. All the camp was all there. Everybody used to follow each other. We was a really close knit team and that, you know. And um, so we was ready. You know what I mean? I remember talking to Ken Buchanan behind the scenes, like, and um, like, like, I'm, I, Ken Buchanan's one of my idols. Do you know what I mean? Um, I love Ken Buchanan. You know what I mean? Um, I remember talking to Ken Buchanan. I'd met him before. You know what I mean? Um, we've been to my gym and that, you know, and um, we've been, we did something, some after dinner stuff, me, Ken and Mad Frankie Fraser. Um, so I'm talking to Ken and Ken's an honest guy and really smart boxing guy, you know what I mean? And um, he says, no, Alex will beat him. He said, I think Michael's a bit too long in the tooth, do you know what I mean? I think he's, I think he's past it. I said, no, Ken, we're going to win this fight. I'm telling you now, we're going to win this fight. But, well, go on. Well, go on, you... I know you said you he was getting better and better in training. You put a plan together. It went out the bell, didn't it? Within 20 seconds. Yeah, we had a great, we had a great, <laughs> we had an absolutely fantastic game plan um, that we're going to make. We're going to give Alex a few rounds. Do you know what I mean? Going to give him a few rounds. We're going to make him work too hard. You know what I mean? Make him box and move. Make him jump around and dance around all over the place and that. You know what I mean? As Mike was conserving energy, 
and then we was going to engage, like, in the about, about the middle, about the mid-rounds, yeah. do you know what I mean? When I seen him having, having, to, having to sit down. Yeah. Didn't want to take him on when he was on fire, do you know what I mean? Because I knew, because... Because Alex Arthur was at least as dangerous as Mike. Do you know what I mean? So we didn't want to take him on right away. I wanted it to drag out. I wanted to take a little bit out of his legs in that first. Had you got down the ring steps before uh, all hell let loose? Oh, Gomez caught him. Gomez caught him early with a left hook. Probably about, I don't know, about maybe 30 seconds into the fight or a little bit more. I don't know. And he hurt him. And I, I, then I just knew. The fight was going to ignite. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, that's that's, ex, I, that's what I didn't want. But there's some there's certain fights. There's certain fights when you can't reel them in. You can't slow it down. So mostly you can. Mostly yeah. you can. But when it kicks off like that, it's like the same thing with Jamie Moore for Matthew Macklin. Yeah. There was no control. It, it once it ignites. You know what I mean? So he got him with that left hook, and that was it. Then there was off, and I thought, fuck me. It's going to be a war. I, I, how does your role change then? You know, you, you've spent six to eight weeks, I guess, preparing Mike with this plan. You've drilled it into him, drilled it into him. He knows what he's got to do, and then all of a sudden, shit's hit the fan and he, ev everything's kicked off. How does your role change as a trainer then? Do, do, you, do you try and drag him back? Do you just try and calm him down? Or do you, do you yeah. adapt to the fight and see what's happening in the fight well, and just go a, on the fly? That's a, that's a good point. You, 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 you've, got, you've really got to stay in control, but sometimes you... Sometimes you just lose control. So yourself. Then, so, well, not myself. The, the, the fight, the fight is just ignited. You know yeah. what I mean? So, there's sometimes in fights like that, when you've got to adapt yourself. Do you know what I mean? And you've got to go with it. The war started now. Do you know what I yeah. mean? When I wanted the war to start at about eight rounds. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I want, I want, I want to tick. I want to tick away from Alex. Do you know what I mean? So when they finally engaged. I want him to be slightly weakened, but sometimes, and when they're both on fire, and it, and it ignites, you can't stop it. So you've just got to go with it. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. that, and that's what it was, and that's what I feared. So I'm not taking credit for the win. Do you oh. know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not taking credit for the win. I got him in shape, and I got him through the fight, but um, it ignited, and wow. You, you like your fighters in the corner to speak to you, didn't you? You like to ask them. How yeah. the other guy, you like them to get give you nice clear answers so that you knew what was up. I, how, how was Mike in that fight? I always tell, I always tell my fighters um, to tell me the God's honest truth, the absolute truth in the corner. And I always tell them the truth in the corner. And I say, you know, like I'm generally calm, and I say, if you feel any urgency in my voice, you hear any urgency in my voice, you know it's an urgency situation. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I basically try to keep calm, but... When a fight's fighting at hot pace, you're in that hot pace yourself. You know what I mean? And, and, and well, the war had started, and um, Alex, I've got to say, Alex was great that night. He was. Do you know what I mean? He fought really courageously. He fought skillfully, and that. But Mike, it was the will. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he was unstoppable. The will. Um, well, you know. He was. It was a fantastic fight. Was the it's one of those fights where Mike catches him early, Alex has a couple of rallies, but Mike always seems a couple of punches away from turn, from winning, whereas Alex looks like he needs a big turnaround in a couple of points. Were you, although there was madness happening all around you and it was a, a vicious was fight, chaos. were you confident in what was happening and that Mike would be able to come out of a war like that? Or yeah. was it just a toss of a coin on which side comes down? How no. did you feel? Did you have a bit of comfort and confidence? No, I was still confident. Yeah. I, I was still confident. In fact, I can't believe, like I've, I've seen it on the TV, and I can't believe um, how I kept it together, to be honest with you, um, because it was chaos. But no, I was still confident. I was always confident, Mike. Mike wanted that fight. Mike wanted that win. Oh, more than anything. Yeah. I knew he had to kill Mike to beat him. Yeah. But... Um, like I say, Alex was showing loads of courage. And you know, I'll tell you something, I'll tell you something. He almost turned it around. He, he almost turned it around um, just before the finish. It hurt Mike to the body a few times. But in, in, the, in, the, last, in, the, in, the, in the last round, just before the end of the fight, it caught him with a wicked body shot. And Mike was already winded. And if you watch the fight, you'll see him 
go back to the corner. He'd already been hurt, he'd already been hurt. So he went, he went back to the corner and I know what it's like to get hurt to the body, you know what I mean? And um, and then when he's on the ropes, he got him he got him with a fucking huge left hook to the body again and Mike sagged, do you know what I mean? And you, and you, you could hear him go, uh, you know, he groaned like, you know what I mean? And he almost sat on the ropes and Ricky, who's a boxing expert, do you know what I mean? He really is. Um, and Ricky just went, he's not going to get over that, Bill. And I don't know if it was just wishful thinking on my part. And I just went, he will, he will. And then he done him. He done him, yeah. Gomez, three big knockdowns, weren't there? Yeah. A, a bit of a sickening finish. Probably shouldn't have taken the final shot, Alex. Mid-rounds. Uh, no, he, should, he, he shouldn't have actually taken the final shot. But look, it was his, it was his hometown. And you know, you know when, you, when people don't understand, when you, when you really want to win the fight when you really everything's on the line and all that lot when you get hurt in a fight what you worry you you worry you worry that if the ref's gonna stop it yeah is the ref gonna stop it do you know what i mean when you're hurt and um that's that's what it was it that's how it was on there so i don't i don't blame the referee or anything like that it was one of them kind of fights and it was in alex's it was in Edinburgh, alex's own town and that yeah. you know what i mean i'll tell you something about that i i don't bet on my fighters i don't i don't, I don't. But um, I remember being in my um, hotel the night in Edinburgh and um, there's, there's plenty of guys who I know who used to bet on the fights and that and they'd always phone me up and that. I get mad to death about that fight, people moan mad me up about betting and all that, yeah. you know what I mean? And um, I told them all, we're going to win, we're going to win and there's a lot of money, people, a lot of our mates won a lot of money on those fights. I'm sorry I didn't bet on it. Yeah, I can I can I can't think what the odds was, but they were sort of massive, weren't I they? I can picture the pubs in Moston now that all that money went across the bars in. <laughs> Mike probably disappeared, did he, for about three weeks? Uh, I don't know. I can't remember, to be honest with you. But you, um, you know, so, so you got the dust settling there, Alex is on his stool. Take us inside the ring. A lot, you know, a lot of people listening may never get the opportunity to be uh, that close to a fight like that. You know, Gomez has just turned his career around, saved yeah. his career, kept his life going because Mike could have spiralled. What was it like being in the ring there? What were people saying? What were the conversations people were having in the ring that well, night? Well, I don't think there was many conversations. Everybody was, everybody was loving each other. Everybody, look, you've done it. You're at war with these people. But when it's over and that event, to so be in an event like that, then everybody loves each other. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And uh, everybody's, everybody was exhausted. Well, he's one of them fights, you know what I mean? I've been involved in a lot of fights, a hell of a lot of fights. And I've had loads of great nights, but that's one of the best nights of my career. Did the, the fans give you a nice reception afterwards, Billy? Oh, <laughs> that, was, that was ridiculous. I was talking, I, I was talking, it, I'm, not, I'm, I'm deaf in one ear, totally deaf in one ear. Um, and, and it only just happened, to be honest with you. So I wasn't, I wasn't actually used to being deaf. I was, I was still a bit unbalanced and all that lot. I was talking, I think I was talking to Jim Watt, I don't know, and um, I could see loads of crowds still there, I was about to go home, I could see all these crowds, all this, all these crowds. I could see them all shouting, shouting things at me and all that lot, and um, so I was waving to him thinking, wow, you know, this is great, you know, there's all booners before, you know what I mean, so I thought they'd like warm to us, you know what I mean, so, so I'm waving, and all, waving to him and everything, and somebody just nudged me and says, Billy, do you know what they're saying? I mean, what, what, what are they saying? They're saying, fuck off back to Manchester, you horrible cunt, Billy Graham, and all that, you know what I mean? So, but it was funny. Can you describe, was the celebration, I know Mike's celebrations were wild, weren't they? He used to disappear, disappear off into the pubs afterwards and emerge a couple of days later. Were you at the point where you were knocking around with the fighters after fights? We, we used to always have, we used to always have after fight parties, um, Especially after Ricky Atlas fight. So I imagine we had one after the Gomez fight. Remember but I, I can't remember. I can't remember. But um, we used to have those are big after fight parties after Ricky Atlas. And a gang of us had used to all go out and then we'd, um, we'd start off drinking in Attersley, where Ricky comes from. And that, yeah. You know what I mean? And we all live in Tameside. I've lived in Tameside now for quite 20 odd years, you know yeah. what I mean? And then we'd all go to Ashton. Um, everybody knew he was coming, everybody expected us coming and it was fantastic. Great days. Yeah. So I imagine we, we, would have, we would have definitely would have happened after the Gomez fight, but 
I can't remember it. Can't remember. Probably got that drunk. I can't remember it. <laughs> well, I think that's it, Billy. I, I, have you enjoyed your first podcast experience? Yes, yeah, it's been okay. I don't, I don't know. I I'll, I'll, I'll we'll tell find you that. out, won't I'll we? tell you that, but I've heard it. We'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> so. so we've got... Um, there's an email address for preacherspodcast at gmail.com. Send any questions, any thoughts, any stories you've, you might have bet Billy out and about. I'm, I'm sure he'd love to hear it. And there's going to be a Twitter page set up, so it's going to be at the Preacher's Pod. We'll put links to everything everything there. Uh, maybe even the odd little cameo from Billy might turn up on there at some point. But let us know what you want. We want this to be about the fans, just to say what we said at the start, don't we, Bill? Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, because the fans are the most important people in the world. So, you know, that's the only way, that's the only way that sport exists. Do you know what I mean? And um, like I say, I, personally, my, me personally, I've been treated fantastic of the fans, you know. So, yeah, I'll answer any, any questions they want. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I hope you enjoyed it and see you on the next episode. For all boxing, info, news and latest interviews, amateur and pro, across and off, click and subscribe. VIP boxing promotions, also Twitter, Instagram and Facebook.